a friend so precious, so very dear to me. He loves me with such tender love. He loves so faithfully. Oh, what a friend. together in the fourth stanza. above all names. This morning we're really reflecting on Jesus because there's something about his name. He's no ordinary person. He's our king of kings and he's our lord of lords. And it's time that we start, we really give him the respect that he really needs. There's just something about that name. Jesus. Let's sing that 
chorus again and really process the words. So let's go, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Okay, they are not ready as yet, so we'll just sing one of the favorites. Can every, anybody from the congregation tell me a song of your choice? Anyone? Four, four, what? Oh, you guys are waiting, man. Four, four, zero. Okay, let's see. We hope we know that one properly, but those who know it will start it up for us if we don't know it. Oh, how cheering is the Christian song. Oh, yes, what a wonderful song. And we're going to sing it like if we really mean it, right? So let's sing like if we mean it. We long to see. We long to see. So we got a song from this side, so we'll come on this side here now. 100, and we have 439. Wow, so 100 and 439, and the young lady said ladies first, so I'll have to go with the 100, okay? So let's see what 100 said. Great is thy faithfulness, oh yes. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. As thou hast been, the forever will be. 
Great is thy faithfulness. Okay, we'll be singing this time, shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. You know, when I look at the countries in the Middle East and I see that our brothers and sisters, they have to hide to ascribe praise unto God. And we are right here in Trinidad. And we have the privilege of coming here and shouting and calling on the name of Jesus without a gun being put to our head or a knife or, or something. So this morning, I'd like you to really shout to God, cry to him, because you are free to do so. For, cry and shout to him because he's worthy to be praised. Let's go shout to the Lord. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise, I want to praise oh. the wonders of your mighty. Shout. 
God, we are so thankful this morning that we can come in your presence. We are so glad that you are here with us. May every word we speak, every action we take, every thought that flows through our mind glorify Jesus Christ. In his name we come to you now. Amen. will now ascribe praise and adoration to our God through the hymn number 71.
our affirmation of faith. It will be projected on the screen and you will also find it in your bulletin. Together, the universal church is composed of all who truly believe in Christ. But in the last days, a time of widespread apostasy, a remnant has been called out to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This remnant announces the arrival of the judgment hour, proclaims salvation through Christ, and heralds the approach of his second advent. This proclamation is symbolized by the three angels of Revelation 14. It coincides with the work of judgment in heaven and results in a work of repentance and reform on earth. Every believer is called to have a personal part in this worldwide witness. It's, it's prayer time. Thank God for Sabbath. I always thank God for Sabbath. When you're a student and you have myriad assignments, quizzes, and other responsibilities, isn't it wonderful to know that there is a sanctuary in time that God gives to, to you? But you don't have to worry about the assignments. You don't have to be concerned about the quizzes. You can just spend time with your Creator and king whether you're a student or a worker or even if you are retired thank god for the sanctuary in time that is called sabbath and this morning as we are gathered here to, to praise god um, there are some of us who looking back at the past week would say god you have been good to us anybody here want to say god you have been good and, and, and you want to give God a special praise this morning. Anybody want to give God a special praise this morning? Isn't God worthy of praise? So if you want to give God a special praise and you, you're so moved to, to come forward to say, God, thank you. I just want to praise you and thank you for your goodness. You can do so at this time. And then there are those of us, we always have requests. God says, call upon me. And you know, when he says call, he means call. And the God that we serve is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think. So as we pray today, we can pray with confidence that God is doing a great thing for us. And say that we That's the prayer for our hearts. We want to see Jesus high and lifted up. We want to see him dying on the cross for our sins. We want to see him as our intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary. We want to see him as our advocate, pleading his blood so that we, men and women, who are lost in trespasses and sins may have forgiveness full and free which is found in Christ and Christ alone. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to spend time in your presence. Thank you for being such an amazing God. There is none like you. You are matchless and mighty. You are marvelous and magnificent. You are holy. You are high. You are lifted up. And to you belong all glory. To you belong all praise. To, be, to you we can lift our hearts in praise and thanksgiving because you are a mighty God. Thank you, Lord, for being our God, for being our Savior, our Redeemer, our friend, our everything in every circumstance, in every situation, for every question you are the answer. 
as we come to you today. We come giving our praises because you have seen you being God to us. We come giving our thanks because we have seen you providing for us. You are still the great provider. You are still the great protector. You are still the balm in Gilead for those who are sin sick souls. You are still the great I am. You are still our Jehovah Jireh, our God who provides. God, you are God alone. And as we come today, we come with confidence, not just praising you and thanking you, but with confidence that you're going to hear our prayer and that you're going to answer our petitions. And we have many petitions. We, they, are, they are petitions that are written in, um, on paper and in baskets presented to you now. Lord, you know those that are written. And you know those that are in hearts. Sometimes we don't even know what we should pray for. But we thank you for the Spirit who is able to translate our thoughts into the language of heaven so that you can hear what we have to say even when our lips can't form the right words. So we bring our petitions and we say thank you in advance for working on our behalf. Thank you for this university. We pray your continued blessings on it. We have, we have been faced with, with times of, of trials, but through it all, Lord, you have been leading. And we are fully confident, just as you have led in the past, you will continue to lead into the future. Thank you, Lord, for the speaker, Dr. Roy Adams. You have been blessing him and using him as a blessing to us thus far. And we have full assurance today that as he presents your word, we will, be, we will be blessed once again. We pray, Lord, not only for this, but also for the upcoming evangelistic effort. And we ask, Lord, that as your word is, is presented, that it would not return to you void. But your children, your sheep, would hear your voice and follow you. So as we return to our seats, we return rejoicing. We return with confidence. We return with a hallelujah, praise the Lord on our lips. Because you have heard us, and you have answered us, and you are working everything out for our good. In Jesus' name, let everybody say, Amen and Amen. Good morning. Welcome. Bienvenidos. Bienvenu. And those are welcome uh, languages that we can speak in. It's so great to have you here today in God's church on this holy day from everywhere. There are people here today from Toronto. There are people from Dallas. There are people from London. There are people from Arima. There are people from Aruka. And there are people from right here in Maracas. And so the University Church bids you welcome at this time from everywhere. We have several faculty members here. We have students here. Welcome, Mrs. Myrna Riley Devines. I saw you looking at me, hoping I would not call your name. I'm sorry to have disappointed you in that fashion. And there are others here. Paulette, where are you? I saw Paulette somewhere around. I guess she must have slipped out. And then there are others that are here. Welcome back, our immediate past president, um, Dr. Valley, Mrs. Valley, and Sister Philip. Welcome. We're happy that you are here. Now, there are some people here today that have a double welcome. A double welcome, actually it's a triple welcome, happens when the welcome is given on Sabbath and it's your birthday. So if it's your birthday today, we invite you to stand because it's not very often that your birthday 
falls on the Sabbath. Amen? So if it's your birthday today, Rachel Stafford Smith, are you here? I think it's your birthday. Could you please stand if you're here? Chawana, I think it's your birthday. And how many other birthdays don't I, do I remember? Uh, that's right. Could you please stand? Give her an amen. Uh, are there, are there no February birthdays? Okay, very good over here. We're going to ask also our visitors to stand. There are more birthdays, I know that. February birthdays, please stand where you are. It's a double, triple blessing because your birthday falls on the Sabbath day. Let the church say amen. Amen. Let the church say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let the church say amen. Amen. Let the choir sing a song. Sister Rose Henry, Sister Gail in Smith, Sister Louisa Paul from Dallas, Texas, Sister Luxan Modest, all the way from London, and all the way from Maruka, Sister Pat Modest. Thank you for being here. May God bless you as you worship him today in spirit and truth. And now for the special music. It's called Mission Praise. We welcome Mission Praise today to our special music as they bring us God's great tidings on this very special day. used to be so broken, lost, empty, a heart with no beat, a singer with no song to sing, so I know the feeling, the silence is deafening, but in your pain lies a blessing. A sweet and sour victory So keep walking, walking, walking Though it seems so far No matter who you are See there's one thing that I know Life it can leave you so To me, I know you're scared, your heart's bleeding. But what are you gonna do now? I think it's time you break free. Hey, keep walking, 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 though it seems so far. No, it doesn't really matter. Get up. 
was almost done. I wanted to die from how I was done wrong. I cried out every night looking for a helping hand. That's when it happened. Jesus took me in. He held me close, gave me love, refilled my heart. can leave you so bitter, 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 bitter. But you must believe that it gets better, better, better. Yeah. Life it can leave you so bitter, 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 bitter. But you must believe that the journey gets better. We will now focus our mind on God's word and the scripture reading for today is Romans 12, 1 and 2, a very familiar passage and I may challenge you to actually recite it as good Seventh-day Adventist. This is something that we learn from um, Pathfinders coming up. So, but I'll give you time for us to all right, so it's there. Let's go together. I beseech that you present your bodies holy, acceptable to God, which is your, and do not harm this world. Renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? God be blessed. It is now time for us to worship the Lord with our tithes, offerings, and gifts. A research project conducted at the University of Notre Dame surveyed America's practices and beliefs about generosity. The researchers concluded that the more generous Americans are, the more happiness, health, and purpose in life they enjoy. They discovered what we already know from the Word of God, that there are promises and blessings we receive when we give to the Lord and to others. God has instructed us to sow bountifully, to give cheerfully, since that's what he loves, and for everyone to give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord. These are the conditions of the blessing. So today, we give our tithes, offerings, and gifts in the brown basket. We give towards the USC Church Building Fund in the white basket. We give bountifully, we give cheerfully, as we have been blessed. Will the deaconesses please stand? Let us pray. Father Almighty, we thank you for the way that you have blessed us that we are able to give this morning. We ask you to remember those who do not have to give, that you would bless them, that on another occasion they too may be able to give. As we present our offerings, tithes, and gifts to you, we ask that you will direct their use, that your gospel may be 
spread throughout the world, that the mission may be completed and that you may come soon. Please, Lord, also accept us as we give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The deaconesses will now wait on us for our tithes, offerings, and gifts. Amen. We'd like to thank uh, Sister Rosie Ward for her continuous service here at the Instruments and also the music department each Sabbath. Let's give them another amen, please. Amen. We want to thank you. We want to welcome our streaming visitors from the United States, from Canada, and from Bermuda. Welcome to the University of the Southern Caribbean here in the Maracas Valley on a scenic, quiet, serene Sabbath morning. May God's blessings be with you as you continue to view this service. The pleasure is mine to introduce Dr. Roy Adams. As I thought of the introduction, I said to myself, men who are great and of substance and quality hardly need an introduction. But at that point, I thought perhaps I should still continue. And so it's my great privilege and pleasure to introduce him. I go back in time. I was in the third form here at the Caribbean Union College. I remember Dr. Adams then, Roy Adams very well. 
He graduated from the University of the Southern Caribbean. It's now, of course, University of the Southern Caribbean, but then Caribbean Union College in 1963. He came all the way from a very far country, the island of Grenada. Grenadians, please give him a rouse and a warm applause. Okay, very good. Came from Grenada. And he came from, I think, is it, there's, there's several islands there. Karakou, was it? Okay, Karakou, he came here to the Caribbean Union College. And then his studies took him to the highest portals of academic endeavor as he completed a dissertation on the sanctuary at a groundbreaking time and moment in Seventh-day Adventist theological history. He pastored, you read it in your bulletin, in several places. He pastored in several places, Toronto, he went to the Far East. And in 1981, I looked at my graduation program at Andrews University as I got my doctorate and saw his name there. I felt good that I could graduate with such an illustrious person, even though he graduated in absentia. And so today I thought to myself, how could I bring to you another vignette of who Dr. Roy Adams is? And I had searched the globe. I went all the way to Zimbabwe to a person who served as the ministerial director of that union and found Pastor Lester Parkinson. Pastor Parkinson, please join me on the stage at this point in time as I ask you a couple of questions about Dr. Adams so that we can gain another perspective of what he offered. Pastor Parkinson. Amen. One of our associate pastors here at the University Church. Uh, you met and saw Dr. Well, first of all, in what capacity were you serving at the time he visited you? Ministerial Secretary of the Zimbabwe Union. Uh, the Zimbabwe Union. Zimbabwe is south of North Rhodesia, that territory. I've never been there myself. Zimbabwe is the former Rhodesia. Former Rhodesia. And the Prime Minister is. President Mugabe. President, President Mugabe. Mugabe. Okay, so it's in that context that you um, invited Pastor Adams. Please tell us about the invitation and tell us anything that you remember of him from that time. Thank you. Um, Dr. Roy Adams, our paths have crossed several times over okay. the years. But significant among those was his visit to Zimbabwe when he accepted the invitation to come to speak to scores of young ministers okay in the union. I discovered that he is, pos was, is possessed, possessed of rare and peculiar endowments. Rare and peculiar endowments. Okay. Significant among those is a spirit of humility and he's a servant leader. Servant leader. Yes. You know, he served those ministers with a shepherd heart and he made an indelible impression leaving with them as you mentioned, vignettes that I believe will last for a lifetime. Very good. Well, thank you, Pastor Parkinson. Uh, there, there's one thing that struck my fancy as I, as I share with him, and he said that he has a, a spirit of discernment. He's able to tell the past, even though he was not born at that time, and he has discovered and decided that he is probably from Zimbabwe in terms of spirit, in terms of where his ancestors came from. I thought that was interesting. Yes, he shared that, but... Um, I, but one of the things that struck me forcibly that he has traveled the world. He has walked with kings, but he has not lost the common touch. I like that. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Pastor Parkinson. And uh, we'd like to welcome our speaker here today once more. And you have heard a lot about him. Please get to know him. And you have my permission to take, uh, to take your picture with him after the service. Ends. But don't hold him up on his way to lunch. Dr. Andrews would not like that. And uh, so this morning, again, before he comes to us to speak, we have, I think, a sister, Alvita Phillips, will come and she will share with us a message in song. All right? After that, we'll get Pastor John in time. We'll get the, the, sir, we'll get the, uh, the, 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 the special now, and then we'll get Pastor John just after that. Yes, Sister Phillips. So that our pastor is here, he has a very special announcement for us, so we'll take that announcement and then we'll have the music. Oh, good morning, church. It's so good to see you. You look so beautiful this morning as usual. Um, well, I have just been promoting our evangelistic activity across the valley, and I want to report that the valley is engulfed in the glory of planning for Gospel Blaze 2016. Amen? 
And um, there are a few things I just want to tidy up before we go. This Sabbath um, would be the last Sabbath before our big march, our peace march, peace in the valley march. But there's something that has come up. Um, the, the elders retreat um, planned by South Caribbean Conference, um, the, the valley, the, the leaders in the valley are saying a better date for that march would have been the 5th of March. Are we together? And so I just want to announce to you very quickly, I know you have been preparing your sneakers, amen? I know you have been preparing your, 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 your white t-shirts. I know you have been excited about that march. The bus is revving, the drum corps is, is strumming. Would somebody say amen? However, we are going to pause for a little more build-up and excitement, and uh, we are looking with favor towards the 5th of March. Would somebody say amen? So we're going to march in March and not in February. And so we want everybody to get ready, get excited. That Sabbath afternoon, we are beginning from Luengo, amen, and we are moving to La Saiva. We are proclaiming peace. Would somebody say amen? amen. We have already um, spoken with our community partners, and they are excited. And they even want to come on board. Would somebody say amen? they say, saying, get us involved, get us on board. And so we are working towards that. And so also our market day. We are planning a market day for the 28th, that's next, uh, next Sunday, and we are planning it in conjunction with the, 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 the USC Secondary School. They are getting all types of ground provisions, are we together? They are getting all sorts of things ready for us to impact the community of Akuno, and so we are asking our people to bring dry stuff, Amen. Dry foods, packs of rice, peas, sugar, all types of things, cans. And we are going to be collecting them between for that entire weekend, next weekend. Are we together? And so we want you to get ready, get on board, buy in bulk, amen? amen. Bring a sack of something. We're going to bag it and we're going to touch our community for Jesus Christ. This is the mission of the church. And I just wanted to rally the church around the mission. May God richly bless you. Good morning, church. We know that our Heavenly Father is in the sanctuary interceding on our behalf. And so I just want to minister about that experience to you this morning. And I pray that you'll be blessed. We have a high priest up in heaven, hallelujah, oh hallelujah, he's our defender before the Father, in a temple made by God, not man. Behind the veil, in a place most holy, hallelujah, oh hallelujah, investigating, he clears the record for those redeemed by his own blood, he's blind. provision for me in the sanctuary he's purifying heaven's temple hallelujah oh hallelujah in preparation for his return 
those who love and follow him he's blotting out my sin in the sanctuary oh he seals my bond with him in the sanctuary in heaven God makes provision for me in the sanctuary at the mercy seat in the holy of holies in the holy of holies for me in the sanctuary oh in the sanctuary in the sanctuary Um, I was heading for New Zealand and uh, my wife was driving me to the airport. It was a very early flight and I said to her, do you have anything of a spiritual nature you can play as we drive to the airport? And the song that she, le she selected had that message on it, Alvita. Uh, and so we listened to the song all the way to the airport. And when I got to New Zealand for the camp meeting, they had that song playing on the PA system every day, that CD. And so imagine how overjoyed I was to hear, where is she sitting now? She's left the Austin, can't see her where she is. Oh, she's down there, <laughs> okay. Imagine how overjoyed I was to, to hear her sing that this morning so beautifully. It just lifted me to heaven as I heard the song. So I'm glad to be here. This morning I was asking myself whether it's my mind playing tricks on me or whether this is actually the, uh, uh, whether I'm actually enjoying this trip to Trinidad more than I've ever done before. And I don't know what the answer is, but suffice it to say that I really 
really am appreciating the uh, hospitality of, um, of the campus uh, during this uh, trip. In an email I sent to my wife, Sheila, yesterday, I said to her that uh, the folks are treating me so well, they're not even giving me a chance to get hungry uh, before, the, before the next meal. Um, and um, I said to her, I just finished lunch, a roti lunch. I knew that would make her very envious. <laughs> a roti lunch. And I said, before lunch, I ate two mangoes the ones that you gave me. I said, I had two mangoes, and I only left it at two because I didn't want to get greedy and eat all five together. <laughs> she loves mangoes. I mean, she if there's any fight in our house, it'd be over mangoes. So I wanted to dig it into her and tell her the uh, what I was enjoying over here. And I told her that um, I had supper at the home of Dr. and Mrs. Gayen. And let me just say, uh, if you're going to have supper at Dr. and Mrs. Gayen, you need to miss breakfast. Eat an apple, and at lunch, drink some water so that you can be ready for what they will do for you at supper. And I knew while I was there that I'd regret it because after leaving here Thursday, we couldn't have lunch. We had to rush to that meeting at, uh, the, at the conference office. So when it was over at 4 o'clock, you remember we had a good meal down there with ground provisions and all that stuff. So I was stuffed when I left there, and then this meal came three hours later. Uh, I think I saw Dr. and Mrs. Gann somewhere. So this is what was happening there. <laughs> but I did my best. I mean, it was good Indian food, let me tell you. If you've ever, invite, if you're ever invited there, go. But uh, have, a, have a fast until you get there. Sister Rosita Lashley, thanks for that beautiful supper last night. I know that uh, Sylvan had nothing to do with it. Um, it's very uh, tasteful indeed. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, and Dr. Pa Ka Parkinson, I will get to the uh, sugar cane later today. Uh, I have to say, you know, one of the things that happened on, on Friday was that uh, um, Pastor Daniel was, Pastor Daniel brought two coconuts with a bowl. He left the, with, with the cutlass. In the Philippines, they say bowl, but we say cutlass over here. Left it there. When you cut, you know, we get in the United States, you can get coconut juice, but there is nothing like cutting the coconut yourself, opening that top, going over the sink, and drinking that thing. And I said, God is so good. It was sitting in the sun before I got it, and I said, oh, it's going to be... No, no, no. When you open that thing, it is as cool as though you took it from the refrigerator. That is the kind of God we have here in the Caribbean, who has done so good things uh, for us. So thanks very much, and um, I want to just say thanks uh, to uh, PA people. Uh, the gentleman said to me, to me this morning, you're in good hands, <laughs> so... Thank you all, because they can shut down this meeting anytime they want. And uh, finally, I want to thank Pastor Marshall. He has been so good handling all the details. Before I go to any place, I have a million questions I have to ask. He has a full-time job, and I loaded him with these questions almost every week as we were coming to the end, and he was so gracious. And he has something at the end of his emails that he may not even remember is there. But he said at the end of his emails, it has the word, stay blessed. That was so comforting. You, you may not realize that. It was so comforting. I may borrow it and put it at the end of my, my emails, but I wouldn't send those emails to you. Uh, <laughs> stay blessed. That's uh, terrific. This afternoon, I believe it's at 4 o'clock here, um, I understand that you announced it as an open forum, but uh, I didn't want things to go all over the world, so I have a short presentation, short in prophetic time, a short presentation. Um, and it's going to be coming from my own experience. It's going to be eight things I've learned, eight things I've learned and wish I knew much sooner. And then after that, we'll have this open forum. Uh, remember, I, don't, I can't answer every question in the world. The older I get, uh, the less I seem to know. Um, so, but we're going to have that. And then we want to end with a very brief Vesper service. And I've Ask Pastor Marshall to have no announcements after that uh, brief Vesper service. It's going to end 
with, um, with a song, and I leave it open as to whether I'll be singing or what, how the song will, song will come. But it's going to end with a song that I want to leave with you as the program ends uh, today. Shall we pray? Our loving Father, we cannot open your word without asking you again, joining in the prayer of the morning for your special presence. And we ask that you will work through our weakness today. May your Holy Spirit's voice be heard. And may the name of Jesus Christ and his name only be exalted and glorified. We ask it in that same powerful name. Amen. There is a certain assertion that seems to permeate modern American culture. Dr. Valley, I forgot to recognize you and Mrs. Valley sitting so stately. You should be preaching this, this morning. Anyway, I'll do it since I'm here already. Uh, a certain expression that has been permeating modern American culture, and I believe perhaps here in Trinidad as well, and the assertion is, you are not alone. You're not alone. You have a headache every time the cat sneezes or the dog howls, you're not alone. You're allergic to moonlight and to the scarlet ibis, you're not alone. However irrational the problem that ails you, you're not alone. Now, I understand um, that this is meant to bring encouragement to people. And I like that. I get that. But the other message it sends, by the way, is this coming over all right, the microphone and all? Okay. From where I'm, I stand, I'm hearing a little too much for it, but I don't want to have to cut that down at all. Save my voice that way. I said that the other message that that sends is that the most dreaded thing in the world is to be alone. And the counterintuitive point my sermon wants to make this morning is that being a Christian often means having to stand alone. I've entitled the message, Isolated and Outnumbered. And I want to take the text from the book of Matthew, chapter 27. Matthew, chapter 27. And I want to read verses 45 and 46. We'll not comment at any length on it at all. We'll come back to it toward the end. Matthew 27, verses 45 and 46. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, Matthew 27 and verse 45. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God. My God, why have you forsaken me? My wife and I have a little grandson named Alex going on four years next month, four years in April. And what a little tyke he is. His parents told us that one day when he was two and a half years old, uh, he was being roughed up by some kids where he, was, where he was visiting. When his big sister Isabel tried to come to his rescue, he declined her help. Ebel, he said. He calls her Ebel. Ebel, I got this. Two and a half years old, not even the big two and a half, is little for us. Two and a half years old, I got this. On a FaceTime call to the house when he was two years and nine months old, his grandma, my wife, uh, said to him, Alex, how are you? His head was bowed, 
with utter seriousness, he said, I'm downloading something. <laughs> In other words, I can't talk now. I'm busy. Two and a half years, two years, nine months old, I'm downloading something. I just learned the word the other day. <laughs> then a few moments later, he shows her what he had been downloading, a picture of a colored glass window that he had taken himself with his little camera, of course, helped by his dad. A delightful little kid, but as stubborn as a mule. And when he makes up his mind, it's not easy to shake him. We were down to visit the family a while back, and I remember one morning um, trying to get him to eat some red grapes. We were still in bed. Uh, usually when we go down, they would come into the, he and his sister would come and join us in the bed in the morning. And I went downstairs, got those red grapes, and uh, I wanted him to get one or two. And um, I said, boy, these grapes are so good. Mm. And I gave two to his grandma, and she ate them. She tasted them. She says, oh, these are good. But he was unmoved. He wouldn't touch them. Even when we promised him a big surprise, if he would eat just one. Don't like red grapes, he said. I only eat green grapes. Next morning I had green grapes and we were in business. I have reflected on this character trait in this little lad and have wondered how it should be handled. If you completely kill it, the time might come when you wish that he had the backbone to stand up against the pressures that he would face. So I think it's a trait that should be encouraged carefully and skillfully. Because I think that if you don't misunderstand me, it takes, it takes a little bit of stubbornness to be a Christian today. The present estimate of the world is about 7 billion people. And the present estimate of the Adventist world membership is something like 20 million people, which means that in any group you happen to be, once you leave the relatively uh, heavy concentration of Adventists around our own institutions, you are likely to be outnumbered 350 to 1. And as you know, interesting things begin to happen to our psyche when we feel, when we think we are isolated and outnumbered. When somebody calls out the hymn in church, have you ever found yourself standing up absent-mindedly to sing only to realize the entire congregation is still seated? <laughs> How did you feel? Most people just sit right back down embarrassed. Or you're attending a program, a concert or something like this and something impressed you and you begin applauding and you're the only one. <laughs> I said, my dear, I'm so embarrassed. So I vowed that in any program I attend, I will not begin the applause. Because you never know. Somehow we tend to feel strange, even stupid, when we are the only one doing or not doing something. I'm talking about something that affects every one of you students, faculty members, all of us. We feel isolated. We feel outnumbered. And the point I'm making this morning is that this psychological Reaction should be of particular interest to us as Seventh-day Adventists, given our concept, given our belief of last day events. More and more, the conviction is growing on me that unless you and I are prepared to buck the tide, unless you and I are prepared to buck the tide, to row against the current? To walk into the wind with the rain in our face? 
We cannot be a Christian today. I once saw, saw something on Candid Camera. Some of you might remember that old program they used to have. I think they still have it in some places. That I considered very significant in the context of our emphasis today. And if you would pardon me. In this particular episode, a Candid Camera staffer posing as a saleswoman actually sold an invisible pair of pantyhose to a woman shopper. I said an invisible pair of pantyhose. The setting was a department, a regular department store. The actor, posing as a saleswoman, approached the female shopper and proceeded to give her a sales pitch on the latest style of pantyhose that had just hit the market. The actor held up her hand and described the undergarment. She said, it is so sheer that you cannot even see it, she said. And it is so thin that you can put your finger right through it, not, not even touch it, she said to the lady. Put your finger through it. Lady, put her finger through it. Did you touch it? No, no, you're right. You're right. And the actor said, it's the in thing now. It is selling like hot cakes. Everybody is going after it. Do you like it? Why? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, how much is it? Ma'am, the greatest thing about this product, the actor says, is the price. You would think that a thing like that would cost you an arm and a leg? It's only $3.50. And what happened next was absolutely astonishing to me. That real shopper went into her real purse, took out real money, and paid for something, quote-unquote, that she could not see. The actor went through the motion. She put some, pulled a bag out of her drawer, went through the motion of putting something into it, handed it to the shopper who took it and went away. Of course, the candid camera people intercepted her, let her know that she had just been spoofed, gave her her money back. But the question I asked this morning is, why did she do it? Why did she do it? You might say, well, that's because she was a gullible sucker, and perhaps you're correct. But I think the reason goes deeper than that. It demonstrates how people behave when they feel isolated and outnumbered. Yes, there were just the two of them in the laundry department that day, but what the actor did was to create a psychological crowd. You remember she said, everybody is going after it these days. It is selling like hotcakes. It's the in thing now. And the implication is, if you don't like it, then there must be something wrong with you. That's the implication. Experiments have been conducted again and again in classroom situations that demonstrate the deep reluctance, even fear, on the part of the individual student to make a decision that is contrary to that of the majority in the class, even though the view of the majority is quite obviously wrong. That student does not want to stick out. One lady told me of a situation she faced when she was attending a non-Adventist university many years ago. Her worldly wise, completely secular professor entered the large classroom that morning and put this unusual question to the class. He said, is there anyone in this class who is so stupid as to believe that just because the universe is an orderly system that there is therefore a personal intelligence behind it? Is there anyone in the class so stupid as to believe that? As you can see, the question is, is upside down and turns logic completely on its head. But what would you do? What, I, what would I have done 
if you happen to be the only one in the classroom to believe a dumb thing like that, the only one in the classroom to believe that the beauty of the flower, that the intricacies of the human mind, that the delicacy of the human eye, that the stability and order of an infinite universe are indicative of a personal intelligence. What if you were the only one to believe a dumb thing like that? Would you have had the courage to raise your hand and say, as a matter of fact, sir, there is one. I happen to believe that an orderly universe does point to an intelligence behind it after all that's common sense isn't it common sense i promise god never to lose my to help me never to lose my common sense but would you have had the courage to say that in the class to bear that kind of testimony instead of that huge silent in front of that huge silent class with the tension so thick you could cut it with a knife and especially knowing that the person who asked the question was the one who would set your final grade for that course would you have had the courage to do it would i have had the courage to do it that's what the sermon is about this morning what I'm talking about here, friends, is social pressure. The pressure to conform. The pressure to flow with the, with the crowd. The pressure to blend in. And that is why I don't want to kill that stubborn trait in my grandson. The herd mentality has always driven human society. Today we look, today we look back on the Nazi... Uh, on the Nazi era with horror, don't we? Seven million Jews murdered. Something like five times the population, the current population of Trinidad and Tobago. Murdered. And we ask ourselves, why? Why? Why didn't the German people rise up together as one person and shout together in unison nine no stop why didn't they do it they didn't do it because a climate a climate had been created a climate in which germany's ministry of public enlightenment and propaganda and that was actually the name of the ministry. Germany's Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda had created an atmosphere, a climate, depicting the Jews as greedy and subhuman and the reason for all the problems. Joseph Goebbels, who directed the Ministry of Propaganda, made this statement. He said, quote, it would not be impossible to prove with sufficient repetition and a psychological understanding of the people concerned that a square is in fact a circle, end quote. With sufficient repetition and knowing your audience, it's possible to prove anything. I mean, are you following this sermon this morning? Is this a problem or not? I face it. You face it. And I face it even in the Seventh-day Adventist church. It is not easy to stand alone. It is not easy. And so he was able, Goebbels was, to lead the German people to accept the monstrous idea of, quote, the final solution of the Jewish problem. Kill them all off. Friends, to flow with the crowd requires no special effort. 
no special effort. I was traveling in Japan once and, uh, and my host briefed me as to what stop we were headed for. I don't know if you've ever been to Japan and in rush hour in the metro, in the subway. And um, just loads and loads of people. So there were so many we couldn't stand together. He was standing over there, I was standing over here. And we came to this stop and I noticed that he was leaving. And I had to shout, is this, is this our stop? It wasn't. But the crowd had picked him up and he was just flowing with the crowd. He couldn't get away. He almost, I almost lost him. To flow with the crowd does not require any effort. All you have to do is to let yourself go. But to buck the tide, to buck the tide, to row against the current, to head into the wind with the rain in your face, that takes effort. That calls for determination. It calls for courage. What we're facing today is a monumental struggle for the human mind. And this is why the words of the Apostle Paul are so, are so ap apropos, so contemporary, so current, so now. I turn to it again. We head into the scripture reading. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And this time I want to read it from the Phillips translation. Uh, I don't usually indulge in these paraphrases, but this morning I would. The Phillips translation of Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says, with eyes wide open to the mercies of God. With eyes wide open to the mercies of God. I beg you, my brothers and sisters, as an act of intelligent worship, to give him your bodies as a living sacrifice, consecrated to him and acceptable to him. And this is the part I want. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. The world around us squeezes us by creating a herd mentality. And like dumb sheep, we follow the lead of the so-called superstars, the Michael Jordans, the Britney Spears, the M&Ms, the Miley Cyruses, the Beyonces, the Black Eyed Peas, the Rihannas, the Lady Gagas, the Kardashians, oh, the Kardashians. These are some of the gods of contemporary culture. We buy what they tell us to buy. We wear what they tell us to wear. We dress how they tell us to dress. Would you imagine that the youngsters would be walking down the street with their belt here and their underpants showing? No, somebody. They're following somebody. You can get people to do anything so long as a star did it first. I have tried to, I've tried to set trends in the past, but nobody follows the trend I try to set. We drink what they tell us to drink. We go on trips they tell us to take. We drool after their expensive homes and cars and boats. And like mindless dupes, we copy their decadent lifestyles. In a million ways, the culture seeks to educate us to, uh, to its own standards. In a million ways, it seeks to dictate what should be the norm for us. One of my local papers, the Washington Post, published a letter some time ago in its advice column. Uh, they, have a, they have an advice column entitled, Tell Me About It, and it is run by a woman called Carolyn Hacks. Listen to this letter that somebody wrote to her. Dear Carolyn, I have a child who is nine months 
old. And I want another one. You have to follow the letter carefully. I have a child who is nine months old, and I want another one. I have been with my boyfriend for almost a year. My boyfriend isn't the father of my baby, but I would like to have one of his. I haven't told him when I'm ovulating because I figured that would be the best way to get pregnant. But it still hasn't happened. I feel I'm being deceitful by not telling him what I'm trying to do. He's in college full-time, and I am part-time. Should I tell him? <laughs> you might hope, you might hope that Carolyn Hacks would say to this young woman, forget about the matter of telling or not telling him about your plans to get pregnant. What business do you have living together with him in the first place and trying to make babies before you even finish college and without benefit of marriage? Does Carolyn Hacks get any close to something like that? Oh, no. No, no. That would not be politically correct to say that. Instead, her sage advice boiled down to this alone. Don't be deceitful. Tell him. <laughs> That's it. So the problem, is not, the problem is not living together. The problem is in not telling him. So the society reshapes our thinking completely. That's why. I don't want to kill that stubbornness in my grandson. So many things that used to be wrong are now right. Marijuana. I was talking to the ministers of the conference. Marijuana in some places in the United States. Gambling is now right. Sponsored by governments. Living together without the benefit of marriage. Something you hid in the West Indies years ago, but today it's just bold out there. It's just expected. I went to Bermuda with my boyfriend. We went on vacation down there. It's the going thing now. Does God change his standards? And there is the gay movement. The radical reshaping of society is in full swing. When a fellow by the name of Michael Sam came out as the first openly gay player in the National Football League in the United States, it was the lead item on the evening news everywhere. The anchors and the reporters falling all over themselves to praise him for his courage. What message does that send? And as for the recent transformation of Bruce Jenner into Caitlyn Jenner, I cannot, I've not yet been able to bring myself to watch the story. I'm so embarrassed, so ashamed, so it just turns me off. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's a confusing time, friends. And sometimes in my private devotions, I say to the Lord, respectfully, I said, Lord, if you had come, about 15 years ago, all these things would have happened. <laughs> and of course, I say, pardon me, Lord. <laughs> pardon me. But I was telling the ministers down there in, in, in Port of Spain that, uh, or where are we in Cura, that uh, wherever it says, the, the conference office now, the folks have changed things up. St. Augustine. I was telling them, uh, one of these days, your elder leaves as a male elder, and comes back two weeks later as a female elder. Then what do you do? This is the crisis that is facing us today. This is the crisis that's facing. We're living in the last times. 
When we get to heaven, the folks who died a hundred years ago, two thousand years ago would ask us, tell us, what was it like? What was it like to live just before Jesus comes? And we say, sit down, let me tell you what it was. Tough times. Tough times. Last May, I think it was, Ireland, conservative Roman Catholic Ireland, became the first country in the world to legalize same-sex marriage in a nationwide referendum. And I was watching the news that morning, and against the backdrop of raucous applause with gays embracing and lesbians kissing, one Irish senator who was one of the ringleaders, who was an, uh, he was an activist, he bellowed into the microphone and I wrote his words down afterwards. Quote, we are a beacon, he said. We are a beacon. But there are countries throughout Africa, Asia, and Russia where it is dangerous still to be gay. So we are saying to them, be civilized, follow the Irish, end quote. Years ago, when the gay movement was just starting in its infancy, Billy Graham made a statement that caught the attention of millions of people around the world. He said, if God does not bring judgment upon this generation, he would have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Billy Graham would never make that statement today. If he does, he'd be eaten alive in the media and by, on social media. Eaten alive. It's an exceedingly tough moment to be a Christian to which we have come. It would call for a good degree of holy stubbornness. It would call for a refusal to eat red grapes when everybody is eating it and enjoying it. We'd have to say, like my grandson, I don't eat red grapes. Who do we look to? As people in the past can give us some courage. This morning I wrote down here in my notes, I'm thinking of Moses down there in Egypt. The Bible says of him that Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And those experiences, the pleasures of sin, I keep wondering, what was this about? If you look, uh, uh, if you look at archaeological discoveries of ancient Egypt, you would see uh, women in clothes that were so thin it could fit into a thimble. And so you think of the hot Egyptian nights in Moses' time. He turned his back on all this. He had to stand alone. That night of Belshazzar's impious fe feast, Daniel was not down there. When the mystic writings from a bloodless hand came upon the wall, they had to go find him. He was alone in his room. And then we can think of Jesus. When he faced the ordeal of Passion Week, he did it all alone. Abandoned by the fickle crowd, deserted by his own disciples, even the stalwart Peter, on the pressure of the moment, said, I never saw this man. I don't know who on earth he is. Peter said that. And he stood alone in Pilate's judgment hall, isolated and outnumbered. And here's what, part of what took place. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 27 again. Matthew chapter 27. And I want to read from verse 27 to verse 31. Matthew 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. 
I want you to picture the scene. He's in the praetorium alone. There are no disciples there. And he's surrounded by a whole band of soldiers. Big, brawny, strapping, smelly soldiers. And he is alone. They stripped him. If somebody wants to insult you, if somebody wants to kill your dignity, they take your clothes off with your to, without your permission. It says, they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Then they twisted together a crown of thorns and they set it on his head. They put a staff in his hand and they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Some of us can stand beatings and that kind of a... But when people are mocking you, when they are laughing at you, that's not easy to take. They mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him. To me, that's the greatest indignity. They spit on him. And he was all alone. No one to defend him there. No one to speak up for him. They spit on him and took the staff that, he, that they had put in his hand. And they, they beat him up. They struck him on the head, the Bible says, again. And again, they struck him on the head. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put, it, put on his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, bearing it, it all in silence. Treading the wine press alone. And as he hung there on the cross, as he hung there on the cross, no hands free to shoo away the flies and the other insects feasting on his blooded face. People passed by and they laughed at him. He saved others. Look at him now, can't even save himself. How this must have hurt him. And in the final hour on the cross, even God seemed to abandon him. And in an agony that utterly defies human comprehension, as the sin of the entire planet crushed his soul, he cried out in utter abandonment, Eloi, Eloi, lava savaktani, my God, my God, why have you left me all alone? That's your savior. That's my savior. He stood alone. Are you willing to stand for him today? I'm coming down because I'm preaching, but I'm answering my own appeal this morning. I want to stand for Jesus, myself, coming down here. Who would stand to your feet where you are and say, Jesus, count on me. By the grace of God, count on me. If that is your decision this morning, stand where you are. Jesus, you can count on me. Count on me. And I want to make two other points. I'm wondering if there might be a person in the audience today who has never publicly taken a stand for Christ because you've always been afraid what people might think. In view of the message today from the Word of God, is this the morning? I'm not going to extend this. Is the morning, this the morning when you say, yes, Lord, yes, Jesus. If this is so, would you slip out and come down? Because I wouldn't be spending a long time on the appeal. If you feel that way this morning, slip out and come right down. A special prayer.
That's the first part of my appeal this morning. Any student, any parent, any person in this audience this morning who wants to say yes to Jesus, perhaps for the first time, you have not been baptized and you want to say yes to Jesus for the first time, I'm opening the door of the church to you. Come now. Come now and say yes to Jesus. Is there someone like that this morning? i wait a moment for you. Come right down. Are you afraid? Jesus was afraid, but he stood up. Moses was afraid, but he stood up. Daniel stood up. Will you stand this morning for him? I wait on you. I wait on you for special prayer this morning. That's the first part of my appeal this morning. Slip out. Slip out. And come. If God bids you come. If you can't come in a setting like this, what will you do out there at the university, at the professional meeting? And the second part of my appeal this morning are for those of you who have children, who are away from home perhaps, or perhaps even living at home. And you know that they're going to be facing this kind of problems that I talked about this morning. And this morning, in special prayer, you want to lift them up. If you are in a situation like that this morning, I invite you to come. For your child. For your loved one. Away from your house or living at home. And you fear for them. You're concerned about them. And you want to lift them up this morning. Before the throne of grace. Thank God. This is Pastor John here. Did he leave for another church? I want to pray for you this morning. Gather close, Pastor John. Fellow in ministry. Here are these members. Here I am. We are concerned about our children. And some of them are following in the faith, but you're not yet sure. And there are some of them who are absolutely out of it. And so this morning, we want to bow in prayer in their behalf. Pastor, you do not have a mic in front of you. I wanted you to pray for these people who are standing by for their children this morning. Shall we pray? Loving Lord, we thank you for such a mighty word from your messenger. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for such a sobering call. In the midst, O oh Father, of this secular culture which has swept our world, where people are moving with the crowd and the focus is not on right or wrong, but what works for me. Mm -hmm. Oh God, in the midst of this challenging culture, in the midst of immorality, in the midst, Heavenly Father, of this world of compromise, we stand on behalf of the next generation. Mm -hmm. We stand, dear Father, on behalf of the young people of this church, the children of those who have come to the altar. Father, you gave us an example when you stood up isolated and outnumbered, mm -hmm. but you stood up for the salvation of the world. Amen. You stood up, Heavenly Father, setting an example that he that wishes to come after you must deny themselves, mm -hmm. take up their cross, and follow you. And so, Father, we pray, dear God, for the young people. Please. We pray, O oh Father, for the children of those who are at the altar, that you would give them strength, Heavenly Father. 
you would remind them of the training they received at home. Mm -hmm. You would remind them, oh God, of the, the, the way of the just and the way of the righteous. And Heavenly Father, may they stand resolute in their commitment to serve you. And to live for that which is right and stand for the right though the heavens fall. Amen. Oh Father, we pray, oh God, for those who are overseas in secular universities, facing all types of secular humanistic ideologies. Yes. Heavenly Father, we pray that they would be able to, uh, be able to find a foundation in Jesus Christ Amen. and hold on to their faith in the midst of those, the stormy challenges and the monumental difficulties that face them. Amen. Oh, Father, we pray, dear Father, for the students of this university. We pray, dear God, that they would be beacons of the true light, which is the light that is found in Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray that they will be ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven and the values taught to them at this university. Oh, Father, we pray that this university would be a place where persons are prepared to stand up isolated and outnumbered but comfortable that they are standing up for that which is right amen oh father we thank you for the preacher we thank you for his sobering remarks we pray oh god that these words would take lodgment in our hearts and in our minds may we not be ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of god unto salvation yes. for all those who believe amen. may we be able to stand for you Though the heavens fall, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. As you go back to your seats today, I just want to say something about the closing hymn that will be announced in a while. Uh, there is something that's done in my home church in Washington that I like very much. At communion service, we sing that song, that song that we have for, for you today. And there are four stanzas of the song, I think. So at the fourth stanza of the song, we want to link hands all across this auditorium, everybody holding somebody else's hand as we sing that final stanza. And we're asking the musician, the, the organist, to uh, give us a little interlude after the third stanza as we link hands and then lead us into the final one. Thank you. And that final hymn will be hymn 633, When We All Get to Heaven. Hymn 633.
church say hallelujah. Let the church say praise the Lord. Let's all bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we were blessed. We heard your message, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you will help us to have stubborn righteousness. That we will be able to be trendsetters and not trend followers. That we will be able to be the standard that the world will see and know that it is God in us. Bless us, Lord. Bless the pastor and help, Lord, that his ministry will grow from strength to strength. Continue to bless each one of us and help that this will be the stepping stone for a new beginning, a new change, and a new trend in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I kindly ask that you be seated and await the appointed usher to usher you out after we do. Sabbath, everyone. 